Thank you for joining us. So welcome to the immediate dentures from planning to insertion, traditional and digital webinar being presented by our very own Dennis Urban CDT, and we will begin the webinar shortly. Dennis Urban CDT brings 40 plus years of experience to the dental profession. In addition to being a seasoned dental lab manager, Dennis has been an eminent lecturer worldwide since 1985. His lectures and courses span many areas of technology, dentures, lab management, shade communication, and implant overdentures. His technical articles have been published across the US, Canada, and Europe. Dennis is currently board president of the NBC, the National Board Certification, and serves on the advisory board for IDT Magazine. And with that, it is my pleasure to say, take it away, Dennis. All right, well, thank you, Jessica. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight on a Wednesday night here on a very interesting topic. A topic that's been in demand for a long time, uh, and uh, so I said to myself, let me let me put together a presentation. Even though it's an hour, it's a less a lot of information on here, and um, I'm going to talk about a lot of different topics. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides. So first of all, Jessica said I have over 40 years experience. This is me in Little Italy a number of years ago with uh, the San Gennaro Festival. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big wine and food guy, uh, but uh, and uh, but I like I can have the opportunity to travel around the world, talking to doctors, lecturing, learning, teaching, seeing de dentists and dental technicians and dental practices, and just sharing information. And I, I love what I do. And it's a, it, I wanna share some of that information tonight with you. And um, you know, one of the, the I, I think in, in my career, I, I evaluated this at one point, I, I made about 67 to 68,000 dentures over my career. That's a lot of dentures. A lot of those are immediate dentures and none of them are remakes. Um, if you don't believe me, do you? But uh, yeah, it was, we, we did have remakes. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. A lot of different information. First, I want to disclose that I do, I'm a full-time employee of National Dentex. If you have any questions or concerns, you can email me at uh, dennis.urban at nationaldentex.com. So what we're going to talk about tonight is a number of different topics. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to include a lot of things that uh, make a a, a, an immediate venture successful. So we're going to review the advantages and disadvantages of immediate denture techniques. We're going to talk a lot about materials, teeth, and acrylics, uh, expansion rates, occlusal schemes, and things like that. We'll get into later on. And then we'll talk about the basic patient evaluation overview for an immediate denture. And describe the surgery and immediate denture insertion. And then analyze occlusal schemes and material choices, analog and digital. You know, it's, just, it's funny because a lot of the mentality out there with immediate dentures, yes, it is considered a temporary denture, but I like to use the best materials possible. I mean, what, what's worse than the patient coming home with an, uh, an immediate denture and their family members are saying, no, let me see your immediate denture. And this, they turn around and say, you know, it's, the immediate denture is not supposed to look that good. Wait till I get my final denture. You want the immediate denture to look great and you want it to function well. You want to have good aesthetics, phonetics, and something that's going to have some longevity you know, because some patients really stick with their immediate dentures and just have them relined. But we'll get into that a little bit later on. So what about patient expectations? You know, I, I learned this, somebody at the, uh, at the Dawson Institute mentioned this to me once. They said the dentist should meet the mind of the patient before they meet the mouth. So what does that mean? Let's get that, let's have realistic expectations on case outcome. You know, not everyone is a candidate for an immediate denture. Some patients may be advised against this treatment due to general health conditions or because of specific oral problems. So let's communicate with the patient, find out whether they're physiological factors, anatomical factors, functional uh, factors, and aesthetic factors. What are the problems they've had over the years, possibly with occlusion, pain, uh, maybe some uh, uh, periodontal disease? Uh, what can we do for this patient? So we have to look at the patient complaints, the history of that gum disease, what kind of support they have? Do they have a bony ridge? They have a lot of bone left in the mouth. Uh, uh, is the stability going to be an obstacle? Uh, retention may be a concern. Yeah, retention is a concern on immediate denture because you're going to have resorption and you're going to have a denture. You're going to have a contention that's going to be loose after a while because of resorption. And we have to also look at the floor of the mouth and tongue room and position. And I'll explain that a little bit further. That way all these factors come into play for a successful immediate denture. So let's look at the original analysis in tongue room. This is actually a, a denture, a full denture that was made, uh, that a uh, patient had extractions years ago and a lot of resorption. But what I really wanted to show here is a tongue, you know? So we really have to make room for the tongue when we're making these lower dentures. 
Uh, when I had my, my laboratory, we had a number of doctors in the, in the building with me. I used to be called down to the uh, operatory uh, and, and, and watch the uh, surgery and insertion. And I can't tell you how many times, as soon as the patient started talking, that lower denture came flying out of the mouth. Why? Because lingually, there wasn't enough room for the tongue and it wasn't contoured for the tongue. And a lot of times the tongue helps with stability and retention. So uh, that's something to take into consideration. We also wanna look at centric relation, EDO, phonetics, aesthetics, occlusion. And we'll talk about occlusion later on. A lot of the uh, occlusion, uh, occlusional schemes I all use for immediate dentures is lingualized occlusion. And you know, you're know, you probably saying to myself, yeah, I heard lingualized occlusion is great for implant cases, but it's also great for immediate dentures also. We have to look at that opposing dentition. Are we gonna eventually maybe do something with that opposing dentition, which restorative uh, um, an analysis and maybe some uh, different restorations. We have to look at that also. So look at that immediate denture checklist and follow through with your patient and, and make sure you have correct planning. Because the communication between, between us at the laboratory and you, the clinician, and at times the neural surgeon is so important for the final outcome of, uh, of a successful case. <clears throat> so let's talk about what we're going to look at developing, developing the treatment plan. So a lot of, lot of us, in, a lot's involved in de de developing that treatment plan. And you're gonna tell a patient that you and the lab are going to do everything you can to give him or her a natural looking functional denture. You know, an immediate denture can't always be tried in and discrepancies can and will happen. You know, this is one of the reasons why I'm giving this webinar tonight, because I get asked so many times by clinicians can you just uh, you know, explain a little bit more what we need to do and what the laboratory needs to do and the communication that we need for a successful case? You know, so we have those discrepancies, but that's okay because once natural teeth are out, rather the way, and bites and occlusion are stable, then we can really begin the more precise denture work. So uh, even though that is considered many times a temporary denture, if we still want to use the best materials for that, like I mentioned. We wouldn't want, want this to happen. And this has happened many times in the past when a lot of technicians and laboratories are known. I, I know that after the case is made, we get screamed at and uh, because the communication wasn't there. So we don't, we don't want this uh, effect. We want something like this, you know, high five. But you want to explain on the lab script if the patient wishes to replicate tooth positioning that exists you know, and give us a study model if a new position is uh, desired. Explain to the labs on the lab script that the patient wants to replicate that uh, tooth uh, shape and size, and we'll do that. Uh, and it's so easy now to do that, with, especially with digital technology. And we're going to get into digital technology uh, later on in the presentation. And then, you know, if you need to show the technician the incisal edge length, that's important because we want to, you know, uh, we want to look at that incisal edge length, and maybe we have to extend it and lengthen it, and then we have to look at it in relation to the patient's lips. And then be sure to take photographs and take at least five images. You know, when you're taking those images, take one straight on with retractors, one from the patient's profile view with a full smile, one from the straight ahead with a full smile, and one at the rest position from straight ahead, and an extra one at rest position again from, from the profile view. So you look at all these different photos, it's going to help us at the laboratory and uh, the technicians do a great job in replicating the information that you give us uh, on the RX form and with uh, digital photography. You know, I've even gotten, gotten so far with the case that uh, we even get little short videos uh, on how the patient goes into excursions, how they, they, they bite. And that helps a lot too when we're setting these teeth, especially when we're doing a full upper and full lower media at the same time. So what are the advantages of immediate dentures? Well, you know, patients will never need to appear in public without teeth, you know, so they're getting all these teeth extracted, at least they're gonna have something to put in their mouth, you know, so, uh, and you know, it's, it's kind of difficult at first after extraction, so it's gonna, it's gonna get better, you know, but they're easy to duplicate, it's, you know, the, the shape, color, and arrangement of the patient's natural teeth while some are still present in the mouth. You know, we can do this with the many molds of denture teeth that are out there and with digital technology. And at the time of extraction, the immediate denture will act as a band-aid to protect the tissues and uh, re reduce bleeding. So some of the more, some more advantages of immediate dentures. Yeah, we, immediate denture will allow the patient to establish the speech patterns early. This is why I mentioned before to utilize the best materials. And we'll talk about denture teeth in a little while. So when I talk about denture teeth, uh, there's a lot of variety out there on the market. <clears throat> so I'm looking at a denture tooth that's gonna be wear like natural dentition. And that's one that's gonna have lingual anatomy. 
so that it's better phonetics and speech patterns for the patient. And we could start this early, especially with a patient who had never had a denture before, and they're, they're putting an immediate denture in their mouth. You want, you don't, we want those phonetics to be good, and you want them to uh, enunciate and speak well. And patients will not will have not have to learn to speak without that denture in place. So uh, it definitely adds to the better phonetics by using right materials and setting those teeth correctly. An immediate denture will also allow the patient to chew better than without any teeth and minimize facial distortion that may occur when teeth are removed. And if the patient is happy with the position and shape of the natural teeth, then we can duplicate that in the laboratory, like I mentioned earlier. So what are, what are some of the disadvantages of immediate denture? Well, immediate denture is treatment is initially more expensive because of extractions and more office visits where a lot of times we're making a surgical stent, which is more money. Um, and additional time is needed sometimes for construction. And we'll talk about different uh, types of setups for uh, immediate dentures in a little while. And, uh, but a surgical stent or a guide for free contouring tissue after extraction, I always recommend. It's often necessary. I think it's necessary pretty much every time, unless you're doing maybe a partial denture. Um, and then uh, more follow-up visits are needed for adjustments and refitting and possibly relining. And a soft temporary reline material may have to be used. And most of the time it is utilized for refitting the denture <clears throat> and relining the denture because it's going to be, uh, become loose, you know, because of our resorption. So let's start on the case here. So the essentials for a successful case, let's look at the uh, essentials for a successful, successful case. We have impressions, we want the right shade, we want the right occlusal records that we need and materials and teeth and everything in between. So, so let's look at the immediate denture seek, uh, treatment sequence and uh, the, for best practices. So usually the first clinical appointment, you're gonna do an exam, you're gonna have a consultation uh, and do the preliminary impressions. At the lab, we'll, we'll uh, make a custom tray, and I recommend a custom tray on, on all immediate dentures. And we'll talk. Uh, I'm going to show a little bit about the technique with the custom trays in a few minutes. So that second clinical appointment, you're going to get a final impressions. Well, and once we get those final impressions back at the laboratory, we're going to bead box and pour those impressions and make our master cast. And if we can, we have to make some sort of record base in the occlusal rim uh, for a good bite registration. There are alternative methods to this, uh, which I'll show, uh, but what I try to do, even though say the patient has <clears throat> maybe two or three teeth missing, uh, I'll, I'll still make an occlusal ring with a base plate and I'll cover, come over all those teeth with uh, base plate wax. And this way you can get a good accurate uh, by registration. So, and then on uh, that third clinical appointment, uh, you'll take those maxillary mandibular relation records. And then <clears throat> at that point, we'll have the tooth selection. So either you'll have a mold guide in the office or the patient might tell you, you know, I like the shape of my original teeth here. Can we mimic that? And we can, you know, so it's, it's all according to what the patient wants and what you think is best for the patient. Sometimes the teeth are so horrible, they're in such bad shape that we'll recommend a, a good mold for you. And um, we'll talk about picking out those denture teeth in a little while. So lab procedures, we'll do our uh, cast trimming, uh, our tooth setup with the posterior teeth. And many times we'll do um, a split setup. So it can either be, either be uh, anterior teeth or posterior teeth with a split setup. Well, what I mean by that, we're going to be removing uh, the, the teeth off the model that are going to be extracted. And we're going to uh, wax those denture teeth to the model. And then we're going to recreate a, uh, a base plate that's going to be removable so you can try it in the mouth. And then you can show the patient, hey, this is what the denture is going to look like when it's finished. So uh, we do a lot of those split setups and uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, but it's important. I like doing that. And then that fourth clinical appointment, um, uh, we'll do that wax try in if you can try in any wax, uh, possibly on the posterior or just for the anterior, just to get, get an idea of how that's gonna look aesthetically. You know, and then we're gonna process the case and it's important with the, uh, what kind of acrylic you're using also. And on the fifth clinical appointment, the extraction and insertion is done. So uh, this is pretty much the protocol and the uh, best practices for immediate denture sequence. But let's get into the, some of the nitty gritty here. So first, you're gonna take a, uh, a preliminary impression using a stock tray and just try to cap, uh, you know, capture all you can with, uh, you know, with an algae impression. You know, I, I have seen preliminary impressions taken with a polyvinyl material. And if the teeth aren't stable, sometimes the teeth come out in the impression. You know, and we got, we've gotten that many times in the laboratory, uh, but I recommend a good algae impression. Uh, make sure you capture those landmarks. This way, this way we can make a good, accurate custom tray. 
and you know, I'm just going to touch on the uh, custom tray uh, uh, a little bit here. So please ask for a custom tray. It's going to help you achieve all the details that are hard to reach with a, uh, a stock tray. And like I just showed earlier, with, with stock tray, you can only reach so much. It, they only, they're only contoured uh, so effectively. Uh, and um, many times on an immediate entry, you can't capture the hammering latches and, and you know, the retromola pads and everything you need with the vestibules and the lingual floor. So you really need to make like a nice custom tray for you to, to get a final impression. So I like a light cured custom tray. You know, most of the time we're making these light cured trays. Um, and I'm usually coming short about two to three millimeters of the border. And the reasons, what, reason why I'm doing this is because uh, I'd like you in the office to board them all these impressions and then and take your final impression. So uh, this way we can get, get capture all those anatomical landmarks, the periphery, the borders, the hamula notches, the, everything we need on the lower. Uh, we are doing an upper and lower immediate, uh, but we need that information. Sometimes what we'll do is I'll make um, a custom tray. So, for instance, say there's six anterior teeth in the mouth and those teeth are kind of mobile and you're kind of worried about taking a custom tray impression possibly with a, a medium body material, a polyvinyl or a poly uh, a sulfur. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll make um, a tray just to go right behind the lingual of the anterior teeth and I'll cover all the areas. Say for instance, it's an upper. Say we have six to 11. I'll make that tray and what you'll do, you'll take a, a like a wash impression with that one uh, quadrant tray or partial tray, and then come over it with an algae impression. And that'll give us a, uh, what we need a lot of times with what we need as far as uh, anatomical landmarks. Or you can come over with a poly polyvinyl if you feel comfortable with it. So we're gonna place that adhesive on the borders of the tray, come over the, tra the borders of the tray with a monophase material or a, 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 you know, a light, light body or heavy body material. And then take a, make sure you capture all the musculature Take it out of the mouth and uh, come over with a medium body, uh, and and then take that final impression. So this is just showing the border molding technique with a little adhesive. This is some monophase material, uh, polyvinyl material. Take getting that border molding done, and then coming over with the final impression. So we'll get that impression back to the laboratory before that final impression, and we're ready to get our occlusal record. So. Um, you know, there's so many different kinds of immediate cases. You can have one or two teeth left in the mouth. You can have, uh, you know, almost a full arch, you know, but any, whatever we have, we still like to get the information at the lab with the midline, high lip line, and cuspid lines put into the wax. Really important, you know, and verify the shade of the tooth of the patient, you know, and that's important also. You know, uh, shade communication is probably the number three or number four factor for remakes and uh, restorations made in the dental laboratory. And if possible, you can choose the mold and the teeth and, uh, and anterior arrangement. And this is a couple of photos by uh, my good friend, Dr. Gang, which, uh, who's, uh, who's done many, many uh, immediate dentures. And many times, you know, uh, the vertically, the vertical on many dentures is typically already established by the existing teeth. So if we have a lot of teeth in the mouth. Uh, well, all we need really is a quick wax bite. And then we place that base plate wax in about 140 degree hot water bath so, so we soften it. And then the doctor puts it in the patient's mouth and it's uh, patient is instructed to bite into maximum intercuspation. And uh, then we'll have a record of the uh, patient's bite. But many times we'll have to evaluate that too. And this is what Dr. Gangwish does. He looks at it, the bite is overclosed. We might have to open the bite a little bit. Um, and then we'll still put that midline and cuspid line in there. So we have something to go by. And it can harden the wax by, uh, you know, putting cold water on there also. But this is another way of taking that um, uh, CR record without a, a full uh, occlusal ring. Pretty much a mush bite, we call it, but it's, uh, you know, as you actually have something to go by in a laboratory uh, and we can set this up on, on an articulator and, um, and then we'll go from there. But this, you know, the information we need really is that uh, smile line, occlusal plane, and we can, you know, sometimes that occlusal plane is really not uh, accurate with those existing teeth in the mouth because they're super erupted or they're in such bad shape. And of course, we need that midline. And we're going to follow that information when we're doing our denture setup. Let's talk about articulations first, though. We know, so we have all this information and we need to mimic that true jaw function of the patient. And we want something that's going to be uh, beneficial for the patient in the long term, also. You know, possibly we have to do, you know, open that bite a little bit more, but I like to use a semi-adjustable or a fully adjustable articulator. Uh, we want, like I mentioned, we want to mimic true jaw, uh, jaw movement here. 
And most of those uh, GEMI adjustable and fully adjustable articulations, they have that intercolumnal inter distance on an average of what we have as humans of 110 millimeters. So this is what we're going to try to utilize. You know, so there's a lot of articulators out on the market, you know, so, uh, but uh, I recommend utilizing one that's really going to enhance the jaw function of the patient. So once you get that information back at the laboratory, you know, the occlusal plane is, an al is aligned to the marked occlusal plane of the articulator. And then you know, we try to um, uh, line these models up <clears throat> so we can do an accurate setup. And so the center of the model is identical to that of the articulator. Sometimes I put a rubber band around the incisal edge, that uh, size pin and go to the uh, posterior of the articulator just to mount those models in the correct fashion. And this is gonna help us when we're setting our denture teeth also. This is showing a full upper and full lower denture, but we're still doing the same thing with our uh, with immediate dentures, as you can see here. So now we have a, like a perfect articulation here, then we can really start setting our denture teeth and going according to what the doctor prescribed here. And we look at the Frankfurt uh, horizontal plane, the Camper's line and the occlusal plane. Uh, if that's not there with the existing teeth to follow that, we, we, we go by the, uh, these guidelines of setting denture teeth, which I'll mention in a minute. But the thing I would love to get on every one of these cases is a Facebook transfer. So when I mention Facebook transfers, whenever I'm lecturing, uh, I always get a lot, of, a lot of doctors in the room, they'll turn their head a little bit, kind of shy away. They're, they're fearful for this Facebook transfer. But it's really, you know, now they make it so easy. And now with um, a digital technology, there's actually a virtual Facebook transfer we utilize. But um, so I like one of the, my favorite is using the Facebook transfer from Artex. So this is a few years back. I was kind of the guinea pig on this uh, when I did my first uh well, webinar on Facebook transfers and by registrations for, uh, for dentures. And uh, what I like about this, I look like something out of Silence of the Lambs here. I tell you, it looks uh, kind of scary there. But, but anyway, what we're doing here with this Facebook transfer, with this particular uh, method, you don't have to send the whole Facebook to the articulator, to the uh, laboratory. So all you're, all you're doing is um, uh, you're taking that uh, 3D universal joint off there and sending it to the laboratory, which I'm going to show you in a second here. But what do we look for in a phase four function? We want to register the patient's maxillary hinge access relationship. And it's going to reference to correctly position those casts on any, it doesn't have to be Artex, it could be a Hanel, it could be a Whitmix articulator, but we really want to have that patient's maxillary hinge access relationship. And that's going to ensure that the relationship or denture is made to the exact, exact cranium access relationship of the patient. I always compare it to having the patient at the bench with us, making these dentures. You know, and uh, so it's a great tool for communication. So uh, yeah, definitely, definitely try to do a Facebook tra transfer when you're doing uh, an immediate denture. So what we're doing here, as you can see, we detach that face, that uh, universal joint and uh, uh, from the face bow, and I attach it to something called a transfer stand. So after the face, after it's, and then you can put this on the transfer stand with a little putty or a little uh, plaster. And we secure it on there, like you see here, with the, uh, the putty or a plaster. And then hold that whole, um, transfer stand goes back to the laboratory, you know, and normally we'd, we'd calibrate our articulators with the articulator in the dental office with usually magnetic articulators. So when I get this back in the, uh, in the, in the laboratory now, I'll have that, uh, that bite fork uh, when the and the transfer stand, and I'll get ready to mount my, my, my case. So as you can see here, first thing I'm doing is using that transfer stand, I'm mounting that upper model on the articulator, and it's to the exact cranium axis relationship with the patient. And all I have to do is fit in that lower model now to the by registration that you took during that Facebook uh, technique. So now we have a, a perfectly articulated case with the Facebook transfer. Now we can really start doing some full mouth reconstruction here. So I love this method. I love it. It's, it's been successful time after time, you know, so uh, it's, it's tried and true and it works really well. So. So now we have our information, you know, uh, by, by registration and that four visit, we're going to try to do a tooth setup and, and wax trying, but whatever teeth we have left in the mouth, or, you know, sometimes what I'll do, I mentioned earlier was do a split setup. You know, at this point, you're going to check occlusion, phonetics, shade, make sure the aesthetics are pleasing to the patient. So let's talk about setups for triangles before we get into setups for triangles. though, what about teeth? There's a lot of choices out there. You have teeth that look like denture teeth. Uh, I, call, I call it a, uh, a denture with like a, a, a denture teeth that are smooth and the acrylic is smooth. I call it a pink smoothie. We want something that's going to look natural. So we want to utilize a tooth 
similar to the one on one to the teeth I'm going to explain it now. So using correct teeth, there's a lot of choices out there on the market. Um, we want to utilize a tooth that's the same size as natural teeth, one that has high wear resistance. I like the lingual anatomy, as you can see here on this photo on top on the right hand side. And we want something that's with shade consistency. I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit more in a few minutes. So let's look at the history of denture teeth. You know, uh, early 40s, we had polymethyl methacrylate. It was a cross-linked material. It's kind of soft, wore down pretty quickly. And then in the late 50s, we had the uh, cross-linked PMMA, um, and similar to what we had in the, in, the, in the 40s. And then we had some composite teeth. I remember in the late 70s, composite teeth came out. Everybody was so excited. Oh, wow, we got composite teeth. They're going to look great. And, and what was happening with composite teeth? They were popping out of dentures. Uh, they were attracting bacteria and stains, and it was, there was a problem with them. So finally, in the mid 80s, uh, Densply came out with the Interpenetrating Network, or IPN. And then we had uh, some good quality teeth, successful teeth that were wearing really well, like natural dentition. And then we, in the early 90s, 90s we had that double cross-linked um, material uh, that Ivoclar came out with. So you had a lot, of, a lot of different companies out there. We're gonna talk about Vita, Ivoclar, Densply, a lot of good, uh, and Colzer has great teeth also. And then finally, we had this nano-hybrid composite material that came out after that, which is great. <clears throat> but what was happening with a lot of this nano hybrid composite material, it was a layer composite over the facial of a, a, a PMMA material. And many times, especially on implant cases, what was happening, say for instance, a hybrid case, these teeth were being ground and put it onto a hybrid case or a, a hybrid bar. And what was happening? There was no chemical bond to the acrylic. And as soon as that uh, patient had started biting down and chewing hard, those teeth were popping off like crazy. They redesigned these teeth now that there was, you know, there's more of a, a PMMA material throughout the tooth when, uh, with a little bit of composite material. So they come a long way with this material. One of my favorite materials is called the MRP material and it's a microfiller reinforced polyacrylic material. And what this means is it has PMMA pearls and it's swelled by monomer. And that, what, that, what does that do? That gives you a better looking material. It's, uh, it's homogenous throughout the whole tooth and it bonds really well to denture bases. And I've used these, this, these kind of teeth on uh, implant cases, full dentures and, um, and partial dentures for years. And what I like about it, even with attachment cases, when you grind these teeth, so for instance, a, 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 an average denture tooth, when you start grinding a denture tooth, what are you doing? You're sacrificing not only strength, but you're sacrificing shade integrity. So we start grinding these teeth, that A2 now doesn't look like an A2 anymore. You know, with this, with this microfil uh, microfiller reinforced polyacrylic material, you can grind it paper thin and it'll still be the same shade and it'll still have a great bond to the denture base. So, so it's a great material and a few tooth companies are out there making this. We want to utilize a tooth that really fulfills all the requirements for aesthetic results. You know, you know we're making an immediate tension. What's an immediate tension? It's teeth and acrylic. You know, so we want to use the, utilize the best materials possible. So I call this the magic triangle for highly aesthetic prosthetics. So we look at shape, shade, and light. Look at these denture teeth. You want something that's going to look like denture teeth, not look like something that's, that, that's, uh, that looks artificial. So you want to have the right selection of molds. You want to plan it correctly. And we'll talk about how we, we pick uh, those denture teeth out uh, in a little while. But you got that harmonious, harmonious traits and transition. Like I said, no matter how much you grind, you're still going to have that same shade and integrity. And you want natural angle characteristics on a tooth, and you know you want to look at the uh, curvature, the emergence profiles, uh, and you really want you know it's great when a uh, patient gets a denture that doesn't look like a denture, and it's that mentality out there. Oh my God, I'm going to get a denture. It's going to look like a denture. I'm going to look like I have fake teeth or false teeth. It doesn't have to be like that anymore. We have to look at the texture, which includes the emergence profile. Uh, we look at the uh, light transmission of these. Uh, it's almost like a crown. The way denture teeth are made today, especially the, to look at posterior teeth today, the anatomy and morphology on denture teeth is amazing. You know, and we can replicate that uh, with denture teeth when it's doing our denture setups, and it's very pleasing to the patient. So we're looking at texture, looking at translucency, especially on the inside of the ledge. You want to look, you know, natural teeth have translucency. So why, why can't we have that on the denture tooth? And we have those mammalized and opalescence um, you know, it's funny when you see a crown and bridge technician, technician or, or, or a ceramist, 
building up an anterior crown. What are they doing? Looking at mammalons, op opalescence, they're layering these teeth to look natural. And these are how many of these, this is how many of these denture teeth are made today, you know, from these various companies. Uh, and of course you need fluorescence. You know, we need fluorescence uh, to give it that natural look. So all those things taken into consideration, these are a, an ideal denture teeth, the tooth to, to pick. So you're looking at a number of different companies out there that make these teeth. So just make sure you, you have a, a good uh, quality tooth uh, that you're utilizing even in an immediate denture. And I, I, hear, I hear this all the time, just, just give me an economy tooth or a cheap tooth and give me a making the immediate denture and give me whatever the cheapest material possible. Now, I kind of talked to the doctor, I said, I said, doctor, do you really want to give that to the patient? Do you want to give the patient a, a, a denture with a tooth that's going to wear or possibly pop out of a denture that doesn't, they look, don't look natural. You want to use a denture process that's going to be quick and fast though, with a, a high, high monomer content, especially after extractions. No, you don't want to do that. You know, so when we're picking out denture teeth, we have to, the anterior teeth, we have to look at the shape of the arch or the study model. And I'll show a picture of the arch in a second. But if you look at an upper arch, it's pretty much the shape of a central. If you have an ovoid arch, you're going to use an ovoid denture tooth. If you have a square tapering arch, you're going to use a square tapering denture tooth. And then if we have something to go by so as far as the existing dentition, uh, we can follow the patient's existing dent uh, dentition with a similar mold. And if we're doing something like, a, uh, if we're, we're, if say the anterior teeth are present and posterior teeth is just present, we can take a bite registration and go from the width of the six anteriors me measuring from cuspid to cuspid and go to the tooth chart of the manufacturer's tooth chart, it's like a mold chart, and that'll give us an idea of how what, what, what denture teeth to pick on the anterior region, you know? So, uh, and then we'll look at, sometimes we'll have a study model to go by also. So this is the upper arch. Look at this picture here. So this is more, if you look at the bottom of the picture where the hemial notches are, that's pretty much where the incisal edges, and then it goes tapering over all the way up to the cervical. So guarantee this, this patient probably has a tapering ovoid face, uh, and that's what the kind of tooth we're gonna use in this type of, uh, type of case here. So, so tooth form, equals facial forms. This is an old photo. I like to show it, but you see show, look at these, uh, these different centrals here and the shape of the centrals and the shape of the, the, the shape of the face. And all these years picking out denture teeth, this is what I went by, you know, and some of the biggest challenges, especially when I'm teaching lab technicians, um, is that the, the challenge is picking out anterior teeth, but it's really not that different. It's difficult. We have a lot of anatomical landmarks to follow for, for picking out these denture teeth. So again, square face, square tooth, Ovoid, ovoid, tooth, square tapering, and so on. You know, so uh, something to keep in mind. And then when we're setting these denture teeth arrangements, we have to look at, you know, we want a softer arrangement, we want a bolder arrangement. You know, with a bolder arrangement, we'll have a, a real prominent cuspid. You know, sometimes the patients just want to follow the guidelines of their previous teeth. You know, and that's what we, well, that's what we would do. Let's talk about that split setup I mentioned before. So on, on this upper photo here, the patient's uh, upper and upper, um, uh, teeth is still still present, and uh, so what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to set these an anterior teeth, and I'll cut off the posterior teeth, and I'll I'll wax those posterior teeth in the model. Okay, that would be one scenario. So another scenario is that the patient uh, is missing their posterior teeth, and they already have their anterior, and they, uh, they're getting their anterior teeth extracted. So you see the, the lower photo here. We wax the uh, upper anterior teeth to the model, and we're able to try in that uh, that base plate. With those posterior teeth so this helps a lot and um and then at this point when i'm removing all these uh, th these denture teeth and uh, i'm making a duplicate model at this point then I'll, I'll make my surgical uh stent or uh you know my my, my, my surgical guide that you're going to be using so so we're going to remove those teeth to be extracted from the model we're going to set the teeth where the extractions were and wax them right to the model at this point, we're going to set and wax those teeth to be tried in on a removal base plate. And then the patient can now see how the final denture will look uh, like before the extractions. So, but what about, I call this model surgery. So this has been the biggest uh, issue over the years that I've seen with immediate dentures. And you know how sometimes immediate dentures, you can have a really bony ridge. They can be really undercut. Uh, and what happens sometimes when you get an immediate denture from the laboratory back to the operatory? You see all these concavities that just scalloped out where those extractions were and uh, set those denture teeth into, into those sockets, which is not supposed to happen. So what I do is I'll grind, uh, the, uh, make a gingival outline, and I'll start shaping the model. As you can see on the lower here, the lower picture here, I want a nice rounded ridge. 
you know, we're going to, we're trying to shape this ridge for the patient and uh, for the, for a good functional ridge, uh, one that's going to hold that denture in place. And so you really have, I call it model surgery. And what you really have to do is do the correct gentle convex shape on these, on this, uh, these type of dentures. And then you say your denture teeth. It's less work for the surgeon, less work for you in the, in the, in the operatory. And another issue was, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen dentures that would severe undercuts uh, on, on that the patient had on a bony ridge and nothing was compensated for it. There wasn't relieved in the denture. Uh, and, uh, and, and to, you know, to, to make things worse, uh, instead of making the denture based on the anterior flange a little thick, they were paper thin. I've seen dentures on immediate dentures where they were undercut and the flange was paper thin. How is the doctor supposed to relieve this area to get it in the mouth? You know, you know, you know, we, we, what we, they be doing an alveoloplasty, uh, but a lot of a lot of times they aren't they aren't doing that, and they have to get that past that undercut. Uh, so you want to make sure you have enough material. So when I teach, I call it mo uh, model surgery. So when I'm, I'm teaching model surgery, I want something. I want something what's shown here on the screen. And what's great now, when you see the di digital aspect of, uh, of, uh, of immediate dentures, how everything's done for you on the screen. You can do uh, tissue contouring, my, and I call it model surgery, but uh, you can do that also on the screen. So, so some good information to go by here. So, so the teeth are not cut below the gingival crest. The terminal five millimeters of labeled gingiva should be trimmed so that the denture gingiva doesn't appear too thick. But you wanna make it, I like it a little bit thicker. You know? At this point, this is when I make my surgical template. So I'll have my, and a lot, many times I'll do a, a suck down or a clear acrylic template uh, because I have everything right here. Now, before, before I set my denture teeth, I can make that denture template. I mean, that surgical template. So I, I make these for the accurate adaptation of an immediate denture after the extractions. And the technician still needs to do a realistic contouring of the, of the cast, like I showed earlier. Template could be acrylic or vacuum formed. And a template must be crystal clear so you can see where to reduce bone accurately. And so the final denture fits well. And if you're making a split setup, the template is made at this time or, or, else, the prep, or, or else at the prep stage before processing the denture. You know? And usually the only time I'll do that before processing, the processing the denture is if I, most of the teeth are left in the mouth and I have to cut off most of the teeth off that, uh, uh, that, that cast. So, Let's talk about setting those uh, anterior, up those anterior teeth. Let me see what kind of time we have. Oh, good, we're making great time here. So, so usually when I'm setting up the anterior teeth, I, I place my upper centrals and I use an alma gauge. And the reason why I use an alma gauge, especially when I'm, I'm, I'm confronted with a, a full upper and full lower immediate denture where the, the tissue is kind of rough and you know we have issues with uh, the quality of the teeth that are in the mouth already. And so I'm gonna just make a nice contoured uh, ridge on the upper and lower. And uh, then I'm going to come out about eight to 10 millimeters from the papilla and set my denture teeth. Because that's on an average, that's what you're going to be, going to be doing uh, when you're setting up your anteriors. Now I'm going to check for symmetrical arrangement. I might have to adjust to make it softer or bolder. And what I'm looking at now, I, I get my occlusal plate. And a lot of times I'm going to set my central and my canine touching that plate. And I'm going to take that lateral off the plate by, by one millimeter. So if you look on here, you see the minimum risk disruption on the top photo here. And you got maximum risk resorption here. So uh, it's according to what kind of case you're working with. You know, if a patient was missing anterior teeth for a long period of time, then most of the time they're going to have uh, some, a good amount of ridge resorption. And the last thing we want to do is set those teeth right on the ridge because it's got, the patient's going to be sunken in. It's not going to look natural and the patient's going to have some problems here. So, so now that we have our anterior teeth set, what are the guidelines for selecting posterior teeth? You know, we have to look at the occlusal scheme. And we mentioned before lingualized occlusion, which I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on in a few minutes. We got to determine the degree of the tooth, you know. And usually, the larger the ridge, the larger the, the higher the cuspal inclination of that uh, posterior tooth. But what can the patient tolerate? Especially a new patient, a uh, new denture patient. Sometimes they can't tolerate that high cuspid, cuspal inclination, like say for say 33 degree cuspal inclination. Sometimes it's difficult for them to chew. So we have other options. We have semi-anatomical teeth. I don't like zero degree teeth. Most of the time I'm using lingualized occlusion for these types of cases. So in, in a normal type of setup, I'm aligning those occlusal surfaces towards the center of the cranium, which is my Kerber Wilson. Uh, when I'm doing my lingualized occlusion, I'm not, I'm not utilizing that, uh, not, not using my uh, Kerber Wilson. I have my Kerber Speak, but not the Kerber Wilson. So we'll, let's elaborate on that in a little while. So 
let's look at the posterior tooth selection. So we have our semi-anatomic and anatomic teeth, as you can see here, the higher cuspal inclination. Lingual eye seclusion, years ago, we used to use a higher uh, degree of tooth on the upper and a lower degree of tooth on the lower. Sometimes we'd even use zero degree, there's a degree of teeth on the lower. But the, you know, the object was to have that lingual cusp of the upper going into the central fossa of the lower and reducing any off-axis stress on a ridge or the implant. And then we had the non-anatomic ramp type of teeth. But you know what? To me, this is having the patient chew like a cow, sliding up back and forth instead of tearing and chewing their food uh, effectively. So I like that lingualized contact. And you know, with lingualized contact, we had that one centric contact, as you see here. And many times that buccal cusp is pushed away uh, toward, is towards the cheek. And this eliminates cheek biting, especially with new denture tech patients. I've seen when I'm doing my setup courses and I see uh, the, uh, the student or the person there that uh, could be a technician or even a dentist setting denture teeth, many times that buccal cusp is, is facing in towards the lingual. And then what's gonna happen? The patient's gonna really kind of gonna grab that cheek and bite that cheek. So lingualized occlusion, I set those teeth out. So uh, the buccal cusp pushes away the cheek so the patient can chew better. It's uncomplicated and it's easy to set. Again, this is just a posterior setup here. You can see that central fossa to lower and you have all these lingual cusps going right into that central fossa as you, you can see here. Um, and now I talked about, I talked a, a few slides ago about setting up the higher degree of, dent of uh, posteriors on the upper and a lower degree of posterior on the lower. Now we have specific lingualized occlusion denture teeth, which makes life a lot easier. <clears throat> Vita has great teeth. Uh, uh, we also have teeth from Ivoclar. A lot of good, a lot of companies have these specific, I think Colser has them also, specific lingualized occlusion teeth, and they fit in like a puzzle, and they're easy to set up. So lingual contact, you got that non-functional maxillary cusp, as you can see here. There's your lingualized contact, but you see here with uh, on the left hand side. Uh, is it just me? Yeah. Oh, my speakers. Oh, can, can you hear me? Oh. Are we okay? Okay, sorry. Just let me know if, uh, can you signal me, Jessica, to make sure you're hearing things and seeing things correctly? Or somebody? I'm hearing you, Dennis. Everything good? Okay, good. good. I, I thought something was wrong there. So anyway, so uh, lingual contact. Um, let's look at the forces here. So anatomic teeth, those forces are buckled to the crest of the ridge. With lingual eyes, with linguals are going right onto the crest of the ridge, so it eliminates those forces. So just keep that in mind. That's why I like to use uh, these teeth. And for all concepts, you know, Gizi was the first one years and years ago, many years ago, who introduced lingualized occlusion. So, but they're, they're good for all concepts, you know, and they, they're great, great teeth to utilize, you know, our implant cases and full, even regular full dentures. Don't even have to be an immediate denture. So, but I'm a big fan of that lingualized occlusion concept. So, as we move on, let's prepare prepare for processing. You know, and then we talked a little bit, and we'll show an actual case in a minute of an immediate. But you know, talk about post dam, diatoric holes, and bonding agents for denture teeth. So what are we looking for in the denture base? You know, many, many, a lot of feedback I, I get when I ask questions, what kind, what do you want in the denture base? Oh, oh, they're all the same. They're not the same. You know, we want something that's gonna have a low shrinkage factor, a natural look, a variety of gingival shades, something that's gonna bond really well to denture teeth. You know, especially with today's teeth. Today's teeth are hardened denture teeth. They're really they're harder than the, the older teeth from years back, like, in, like I mentioned in the 40s and 50s. And so it takes a little bit more and longer for that to bond, have a natural bond to, uh, to acrylic. Uh, we also wanna have flexural strength with impact resistance. Without that flexural strength, that impact resistance, resistance doesn't mean anything. All you're gonna have is a brittle denture. And when it's something that's gonna have good finishing and polishing properties, good color and fit stability. So these are, uh, these are the uh, five sets of dentures I made with a high impact material. You can see at different, different levels of, uh, of gingivous tone there. And there's a lot you can do with this material. You could do even do denture-based staining, which I talk about in my other courses. So we want to make sure that, you know, whether traditional printed or milled, high impact resistance, flexural strength, and of course, natural looking shades. And importantly, we want something that's going to have a great bond between a denture tooth and the base. The last thing we want is uh, getting a brand new denture and the patient looks at the dent, goes home and starts eating and teeth pop out of the denture. You know, so 
we there's, you know we want something that's going to really bond well to the denture base. So I wanted to show this slide slide here. I want to show the, show you the percentage of that full denture. If you look on the left hand side, percentage of fully dentures that are highly aesthetic. Uh, and about 29% of the industry, this is an industry survey that was uh, done. This, we just got it recently about a couple of months ago, but it was done in 2021. And then you have your standard dentures, uh, which is about uh, 30, was it um, 31%? Yeah. And then premium dentures uh, are only about 25% of the market. So that first premium materials I'm talking about, you know, and could be because of insurance or cost or whatever, but it's only 25%. And then the percentage of denture sales on the market, uh, we have um, you know, full dentures are still 60%, and then metal parcels about 22%, and acrylic or flexible parcels are about 18%. So uh, what, what I wanted to really show here is the percentage of denture acrylic, of denture processing that's done. Still the majority of denture processing, 55% is still the old compression method or press pack method. And uh, although injection is the most accurate way to the process of denture. Then you have the poor acrylic, which gives you a higher monomer content. And then you have light cure, which is, doesn't really give you any, that high flexural strength doesn't really work that well. So 55% of the dentures are still processed by the traditional method. But supporting literature and the studies that have been done, the most accurate way to, uh, to process a denture is by injection. Of course, you have less shrinkage and you have constant pressure on the denture at all times. But, uh, and, you know, but then when you look at the Digital aspect of things now that's also very very uh, very accurate also. So look at the uh, the, the uh, um, volumetric shrinkage here. You know, one point six 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 percent compared to press pack with six point six eight. And you can see here this is a photo. And I don't got I never got this much shrinkage. I don't know what material they used on this left hand side there. You know, I'm, I'm, my my fits are very good with the uh, with press pack, but if you do the studies and you look at the actual under uh, you know micros, micros, microscope the um, uh, injection is much more accurate. So increased retention and stability, fewer sore spots, and minimized uh, collusal adjustment. So what am I doing getting ready for the final denture? I'm gonna put a post dam in my upper denture. This is what I do. I make a butterfly post dam, about two to three millimeters. I have a nice special tool here, like a little scoop here. I, I, I do this on every denture. And I'm finding out now with uh, on milled digital dentures, that the fit is so intimate, a lot of doctors aren't even asking for that post dam anymore in, in the digital mill dentures. Is that something? So on the right-hand side, you see that vibrating line here, and we still, I don't care if it's an immediate denture, I still put that post dam in that immediate denture. We create, create some sort of suction in the mouth. And then uh, we talk about diatoric holes in teeth. I always put diatoric holes in the teeth. I put, you know, it just adds the retention. But what happens when you put a diatoric hole, like you see in uh, number two here on the right-hand side, uh, with like a number eight bar. Well, you're putting too much volume in there. You're, you're taking away too much denture, the denture tooth and it, that can result in breakage or weakened tooth. So I use a number two bar to, to, to do a couple of holes on each tooth here. And then I, that gives me some good uh, retention when I uh, we try to bond it to the denture base. And as an added uh, insurance here, there's a couple of bonding agents I utilize on the market. This is Pala by, uh, by um, uh, Horace Coles, Vita has them, uh, you can use Monomer, but these really ensure reliable bonding of the denture teeth and the denture base. And that results in a re uh, you know, really reliable bonding because you don't want to worry about uh, that those denture teeth breaking away from the base. So, and when we're waxing these dentures for finish, I wanna make sure I am gonna mimic what the patient had in the mouth. And we want something that's gonna have, again, lingual anatomy on the, on the uh, anterior teeth. I put a rugae in there. Many times I'll take a wax impression of the patient's rugae and I'll lay it in the palatal area. And so the patient feels like they, it's, it's a natural rugae in the mouth. So waxing to me, I, I have, that's a whole other course I do on waxing. So this is a, just to show what we can do with waxing here. And then finishing, I'm just gonna go through this. I'm gonna get into some of the, uh, how much time we have here. Yeah, we have time. Okay, so I'm going to just talk about finishing correctly. And the re reason why is because a lot of times you have to adjust these dentures in the office here. So this is what I usually do. I call it an urban nine point finishing system. It doesn't have to be nine points. It could be four or five points, but I just want to show you what you do here. First thing I'm doing is I'm taking my acrylic reducing wheel and I grind the acrylic down on the borders. I cut out my muscle attachments using a flex disc. And this is what I wanted to show. This 52D carbide, which you can buy from any bar company, um, it's great for relieving immediate dentures. And I go on the inside. A lot of times, like I said, you get that scalp area when you get, you might be getting from your laboratory. You have to relieve those areas. 
this is 52 gar carbide works really well. Then I start festooning and contouring it with an 81A flame burr. I'll take my D1 half and do some reduction here. Again, I want to leave some acrylic on the anterior. If I, you, have to, you have to adjust, we want to leave some acrylic for you so you can adjust it in the office here. No. Okay, a palatal area, I'll use that D1 half as step six. Then I'll do my fine tune festooning with a number 88A burr. Go around each tooth, make it look really nice. And then I'll make sure the cervical or uh, cervical area is nice uh, with this number two burr, and I'll uh, finish that. Then I'll I'll put in stippling. And my two, I take this number two burr like I just showed you, and I'll bend, I'll heat it and bend it, and I'll go around the denture and I'll put little, little divots in the denture, and it'll look like stippling. So when I polish it, oh, we're all set to go. And there, there we went through the nine steps. We got a nice finished denture here, a nice polished denture. You can see the stippling in the final denture here. So. This guy's pretty happy he finished the century, but uh, now we're ready to polish. I just wanted to show that, but that, yeah, that one, yeah, those, those burrs really work out well, especially when you're relieving, even that 88A burr works great when you're relieving dentures in the office here. So, so let's talk about the transformation from dentalism to edentalism. We might go, you know, maybe five minutes over tonight, but I just wanted to get this, uh, uh, this in there. So uh, developing the treatment plan. So you, the dentist has responsibility to determine what treatment is possible, realistic and practical for the patient. In many instances, this is relatively straight, straightforward, you know, especially for those patients with a few problems. But for the patient with severely decayed teeth in both arches, the dentist might, might not see the patient ultimately wearing acrylic dentures or even using, and then possibly using implants to support these dentures. So, uh, you know, when developing these treatment plans for the patient with a variety of tooth related problems, such as periodontal disease, caries, and failing large restorations, a first step may be needed to identify the important or key teeth that could be salvaged. So, and you know, with that, you, know, if you want that systematic phase of treatment, which involves a thorough evaluation of the patient's health history, which I talked about before. So let's look at this case sequence here. This is a case before, for, the patient had a couple of extract, extractions done here, but I think a few of these still had a piece of the root in, in the mouth there. So this is a case before the extractions, the case after the extraction. So, uh, so immediately after the extractions here, and this is after a while after healing, and look at the case after uh, final healing. Look how nice that, uh, that ridge healed. Really nice healing uh, sequence here. And this was the final result here. And the case had to be relined. So you know, this is still uh, a relined denture with soft, soft reline, and the patient was still able to wear that. Is this going to be the final denture? Probably not, but the patient has something nice to wear you know, uh, in between. So what about alveoloplasty, uh, alveoloplasty uh, rather, um, and what that involves? Well. We get that a lot with those really bony ridges. We do a plastic, you know, and you know, you can do, you can remove the teeth and cut the gum and create that surgical flap to expose the bone and, you know, reshape the bone by using a series of bone files, you know, and a lot of doctors don't even need to do the uh, plastic because they use a rongeurus to snip and snip those, uh, those high areas, those bony areas, you know, but you can see the difference on, on the, uh, the, the photo on, on the bottom here. Um, and then, uh, you know, after it's stitched, but the complexity of the procedure depends on the location, degree of correction and the expanse of the extraction site, you know, small lumps can, uh, you only need work on the surface of the bone with that probably a rongeur and then, uh, larger ones require the removal of sections of bone. But on a follow-up with the alveoloplasty is, you know, recovery from this is pretty, pretty much like that of an ordinary dental extraction. You know, uh, especially when you have that denture in place and, and you know, it's, it might be remain, remain sore for about a week, but the dentist can prescribe pain medication and they give them instructions for general oral hygiene, you know, but uh, uh, dentist has concern about infections, he or she might prescribe an antibiotic, a biotic, a biotic as well. So, you know, so this is just showing many times what happens in, in, the, in the, uh, you know, before the insertion of the final uh, uh, immediate denture or the immediate temporary denture. And sometimes we can create a flangeless immediate denture if the bone is a really bony situation, but you know, insertion is not a problem because uh, it just, a, it just re uh, involves the extraction of the remaining teeth and no alveoloplasty is performed. So it's less post-operative comfort, discomfort rather. So, uh, uh, and long-term solutions are not very good because I've seen these happen. I've, I've done these types of dentures is there's resorption is continuous relining of the anterior region, you know, so it, many times it really doesn't work out well when we wind up putting a flange there. So, 
So after insertion, you know, instruct the patients not to take the denture out until the next morning following their extractions. Then they have to carefully remove that. You know, the patient will rinse it under cold water um, and then instruct, instruct the patient to rinse their mouth gently using salt and water. And then the patient can put the denture back in their mouth and clean any remaining natural teeth. So pretty simple, straightforward after insertion. A new denture after immediate? Yeah, I think so. I think you should get a new denture after a certain amount of time after immediate. You know, discuss the pros and cons of a permanent reline versus making a new denture. You know, major advantage of making a new denture is that the immediate denture can be used as a spare. And then if the immediate denture is reliant for long-term use, I recommend a laboratory process reline. It's more accurate. So looking again at the digital technology, and then we'll take any questions. I want to just show you a little bit about what's out there with digital technology for immediate dentures. You know, and you know, if you look at the amount of digital dentures that are done uh, being done right now, it's about eight to nine percent of the market, and which that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's all you hear about is is digital dentures. I love. Don't get me wrong. I love digital dentures. I love what we can do with digital dentures, especially with immediate dentures. I love partial uh, digital dentures. It's so predictable when you're designing partial dentures with the software that's out there today. And even on full dentures, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's predictable. You know, so uh, you know, it's only 8% though, right now, 8 to, eight to 9%, it's probably higher now. Uh, people are getting more accustomed uh, to doing the digital dentures. The materials are much better with uh, what's, what's out there now. So digital case processing or planning, we have digitation, case design. We do a printed try-in now instead of, um, uh, the uh, wax trying, and then we print or build the final denture. We get whatever uh, software you're using, 3Shape, Exacad, whatever you're using, we enter all the information on the form in the beginning on uh, in the software, and then we can start uh, designing the case. So, you know, we can either scan the model or the final impression. Sometimes with the, with the immediate dentures now, we'll get a, a digital scan from the dental office, and a lot of times they'll, they'll take a, a pretty good di uh, digital scan on an immediate denture. And sometimes we don't get a good one. So many times the doctors say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wind up relying in any way to go ahead and finish it. But I like to get a good accurate impression. So, you know, you, what you see on the screen is amazing now with digital dentures. You can really pick up so much information, you know? And so if we get an occlusal rim or a bite back in the laboratory, we're scanning that. And then we merge it with the original file with the impression and we do a nice setup and I'll show you how we do that in a minute. Technology is great, but this is that printed triangle I was talking about before. So you know, instead of having that nice uh, looking triangle in the wax, we have kind of a monolithic triangle. You could do quadrant triangles. That's what I like about this too on the printed triangles. We could do a two piece triangle if we need to, you know, so we can uh, do what I talked about before with split setup. We can also do that too. But again, they come in different shades, but pretty much it's like a, a kind of monolithic looking uh, type of uh, Try and I, a lot of times I'll add some wax to the denture base, uh, print a try and base to make it look more natural. So what I like also about this material, if it's going against, uh, you know, the opposing uh, natural teeth, you know, we have articulations with a uh, virtual articulation with centrical and lateral adjustments. So wherever the patient is hitting hard here, it'll show up on, like you see on the right hand side. And then we can, in this case, we're either going to print denture teeth or we're going to mill denture teeth. Very important to know that. So and we'll have to, we don't have to do a complete reset when the tooth needs to be removed. Removing molars and premolars is easy as a click of a mouse. As you can see here, we're going to remove a premolar here, highlight it, and it's gone. You know, so we, we do full mouth setups all in, in a matter of seconds. And then this is what I love. This is the, for instance, an immediate denture on this person's on the right-hand side here. Uh, and all I have to do is highlight the tooth and it's gone. After everything's highlighted and gone, we're doing all the extraction. I can, I can start doing my tissue contouring, as you can see on the right hand side here. And then we can also make a digital uh, surgical, surgical stent. And that works out great. And then we have a pre prep scan. Say if the patient wants to follow exactly the shape of their teeth or what they, were, what they had before. This is, for instance, the patient loves what the, the arrangement, you know, they might like what they see. We do a pre prep scan here and everything comes into play and then we could print uh, or mill our denture teeth. Pretty cool. So you have a lot of choices. You can either print and the printed material that's out there now is really nice. If you asked me five years ago, what about printed dentures? I would say, man, it looks like bubble gum. They attract bacteria, they're brittle. Now the material is great now. They have really good material out there. And uh, so you can utilize printed teeth, which are getting really, really nice now. They look really aesthetic looking. Um, they, they wear really well, or you have a mill teeth. 
you know, you can do quadrants, pull arches, you know, a couple of teeth at a time, whatever you want to do. And then you bond them into the denture base. Then you, you have a choice, of either those the milled, printed, or you can you still utilize individual carded teeth. So the, the, the problem with individual carded teeth though, as you can see, there's a couple of different tooth brands here, is that many times the uh, ridge lap on these are thick and it's too thick to put into a digital denture and they, uh, we get error codes on our screen that there's too much tooth and not enough denture base. So, so this was the first digital denture I ever made. This was five years ago. And I used a mill denture base and I, these would be the teeth on there. And I think, and I bonded these teeth in the acrylic. Look how nice that came out. I mean, so yeah, definitely this uh, come a long way with digital dentures here, you know, and with immediate dentures, we're really successful with them. And of course the patient wants to be able to eat everything. So uh, throw out that baby food and give them everything to eat. So this is why we use the right materials and methods and communication. And we want a final result that looks like this. Isn't that nice? That's a, that's a denture. That's a fully immediate denture. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining me tonight and joining us at National Dentex. 